are doing beginning vegetable gardening with Susie Nachnagel from Summit Landscaping, and I'd like to turn it over to her and let her. Right. Thank you so much. All kinds of interesting stuff. Great. Well, as she just said, my name is Susie, and I work right across the street here in Airport Road. Um, Summit Landscaping has a little garden center in addition to doing all the landscaping projects and maintenance work and everything that we do. Um, the point of this is not as a promotional thing, and so I'm going to try to leave us out of it. Other than there are times I'm going to be mentioning products that we carry um, that you might be interested in and just letting you know a lot of the timing of things and when things are going to come in. But you guys can shop anywhere you want. That's not, this isn't just about summit landscaping. So I kind of want to find out a little bit about the audience tonight. The class is called Beginner Vegetable Gardening, but I always know that some people that maybe have a little experience or, if nothing else, experience in a different climate zone <coughs> might be here. So I just want to find out how many of you are plot holders this year at one of the Summit County Gardens? Everybody. I, I didn't know if maybe a couple people just are coming for other, you know, their own private gardens, which is fine, too. Um, how many are in the Breckenridge Garden? Great. How many in Frisco? A couple in, anyone in Dillon? Silverthorne? Okay. Those are the, the big two. How many of you had a plot last year? Raise your hand if you did. Only you. So, are the all, so you're the only one. Does anyone here have any gardening experience, vegetable gardening experience, at this elevation? <coughs> Little bit? Okay, what kind of things have you guys tried to grow? If you want to just... um, mostly, uh, you know, leaf vegetables, yep. um, lots of herbs, lots of, um, do lots of rhubarb and kale and Swiss Great. chard and spinach and all those kind of yeah, things. Yeah, you're saying Onion, all the right onions, things. Carrots, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Kind of things. How about, I think, did you raise Pretty much the same, same thing. Same kind yep. of stuff, and how about you? Yeah, she's part of my team. Oh, okay. <laughs> same garden. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, some of the things that he listed off are exactly the things we're going to be talking about tonight. I have a handout that lists all the things that grow really well in Summit County. I'm going to tease you a little bit and not give this out right away. I want to talk about a few other things. And the reason for that is I just know it's human nature. Once you have that piece of paper in front of you, you just start reading it and maybe aren't going to listen as much. So we'll get to that in a little bit. I want to just, first of all, start about just some of the fundamental things about um, having a plot in Summit County at one of these um, High Country Conservation Center gardens. First of all, you're going to have a raised bed, and raised beds are fabulous. And the reason for that, one, is you have so much more control over the soil. If you're just trying to plant your vegetables straight into the ground at home, you just need to do so much work to your soil to amend it and get it nice and fertile and a good growing medium. Your raised bed should already be that. You should not need to do too much to it. The ones in Breckenridge got brand new soil and compost last summer, so they're pretty fresh. The ones in Frisco, I'm not sure, um, that would be something that Jen would know more about, how recently they've amended those with fresh compost. But assuming that they have received some fresh compost pretty recently, you've got a really great growing medium in your raised bed. And what that means is you don't need to do a lot of fertilizing or amending of the soil. It should already be pretty good. We're going to talk a little bit about amending soil and fertilizing in case you get there and look at your soil and are like, hmm, this feels and looks like it might need a little work. Um, but you should have a pretty good start. The other thing I love about raised beds is they're generally pretty easy to access. They did a really good job, I think, of designing the ones here so that you can walk around and reach the different sides of your bed. But one of the things I just want to make sure before you start planning your garden is have a plan. Before you start planning, you're going to want to have picked the eight to ten things that you want to grow this year and kind of draw a little diagram of where you're going to have those things and just make sure that you're going to be able to access everything. I know, I think it's some of the Frisco gardens where they're, you know, butted up against each other in a way that it can be a little harder to access. And a really easy solution to that is just to like lay some bricks or stones down in an area before you start planning that you know that you can walk on those bricks or stones to get to everything. 
Um, but you're just going to want to have a plan for that because once you plant things, you should never be stepping in your garden. You should never be stepping on that soil that's really bad for it and is not going to promote growth. So have a plan is really the essence of that message. Um, the other thing that's really nice, I think, about raised beds is in general they're a lot easier to keep weed free because, well, everything's elevated, it's easier to get in there, and assuming we've got pretty good soil, you know, let me back up, there's weed seeds everywhere. They blow all over. You're not going to have a weedless garden. That's impossible. Weeding is part of any growing that you're going to do. So be ready for some of that. But by having a raised bed, you should have a little more control over the soil and the weeds that are in it. And if you choose to mulch to prevent weed growth, it's really easy to do because you've got this confined space that's elevated. So hopefully that'll help you guys out having that. For those of you who are really brand new to gardening, which seems like most of the people in the room, a couple things I just want to suggest. One is keep a notebook through your process. Write down the dates that you plant things, what you plant, um, how they're doing if you do amend your soil. Make notes of everything. I have been, I have my own garden at my house that I've had for six years, and every year I just keep notes, and I look back at them all the time. And sometimes when I have a failure, it's really easy for me to go back and identify what I probably did wrong. So that's advice number one is keep a journal or a notebook as you as part of your process. Another thing is if you're um, gardening for the first time up here, vegetable gardening, I would keep it pretty simple your first year. It's really tempting to want to grow 15 different things, but that's a lot. And I don't know, everyone's different. You may want to take on that kind of challenge. One, keep in mind that your plots aren't huge. They're great, but they're not enormous. And it just, I think you learn more and might be more satisfied if you pick like eight to 10 things to try to grow in there, um, rather than more like 15 to 20. I walked through the gardens here a lot last year and people were all over the place with what they were doing. And it's fun, I mean, it's your garden, do whatever you want. But I, my advice is just your first year, keep it simple, keep a notebook. Um, the other thing I like to make sure people know is a lot of people are really surprised by how much time and energy they're going to end up putting into the garden. It's wonderful. It's soulful time. Hopefully you're going to really enjoy that time, but it's not like you can just stop by your garden once a week. And so if anyone was hoping that's all that was going to be involved, you might want to reconsider. Um, I know that Jen has set up a really great network. I think you guys might have like a Facebook page where you can communicate with each other if you're going to be out of town and can't get to your garden to water, you can arrange for someone else to do it. So if she doesn't have something like that set up, make sure you start making friends with all the other plot holders because you don't want to be totally confined by your garden and feel like, oh, every day I have to go down there. But it does take a lot of time and energy to actually plant everything, to maintain it, keep it weed free, to be watering it, and then to harvest. Um, so just expect to put some time into your garden this summer. And again, I hope it's wonderful time. I hope it's a great part of your summer. Um, and if everything goes well, you will be getting the fruits of your labor, which is really nice. Um, and then the other thing that's so cool about having a garden in a plot here is that you get to have your own little experience and then you get to observe the experience of everyone around you. So take advantage of that. If your garden isn't doing that well, start talking to the other gardeners that are having a successful year. What did you plant? Did you amend the soil? What did you might have done differently? So you're constantly learning. So, okay. Um, I'm about to hand out the sheets. Um, the, the thing I do want to explain before I hand them out is you're going to see on here, it talks about the planting method for everything. And it's going to say either direct seed, transplant, or like from bulbs or sets. Most of the things on here you can do from direct seed. And what that means is you're going to buy a pack of seeds like this and take all these little seeds and put them in your soil and things will start growing directly. That's the least expensive way to do it. And in my experience of six years of vegetable gardening in Summit County, it's actually the most successful way to grow most things. So if 
one of the choices is to do it by direct seed, that's what I recommend. There are some things that it'll say they recommend doing a transplant. And what that means is you're going to go to one of the garden centers and buy little starters. What all that is is someone else in a greenhouse is already growing the little zucchinis for you or whatever it is that you wanted to grow. They've already started growing, giving you a big head start. Those are the kinds of things that have a longer growing season. We have a pretty short growing season up here. And so a lot of the things you're gonna be growing are the kind of things that only have like a 50 or 60 day growing season. But if you wanted to try things with a longer growing season, hopefully someone's already started them for you right now and you're gonna be planting them here in another month or so. Um, and then that's when they become your own. So for example, at our garden center, we sell tons of vegetable starters. And for some people, it's just easier. You know, it's more of the instant gratification. There, you got your plant. So, um, but it'll advise you about that. And then there's a few things, and it's mostly like the onions that you're gonna actually buy in sets. And what that means is it's actually like a little onion bulb. Onions do great up here. And they're like the green onions, the kind with the long, tails and you can eat the whole thing, but you need to buy the onion sets. If you try to start onion from seed up here, we don't have a long enough growing season for most people. I mean, maybe some people have had success with them, but I sure have not. Um, but buying them from sets does a great job. Now we can look at this list is something that myself and Jen Santry collaborated on, and I want to give you a quick history of this. See, I can already tell everyone's reading. That's why, that's why I waited. Um, we put this together last year, distributed it to all the plot holders, and then what we did was at the end of the season, Jen collected information from all the plot holders about their successes and failures, and based on that, we updated this. So this is actually an ongoing thing that we'll continue to do. There were a few things we just omitted. We were like, wow, every all 10 people that tried to grow this one vegetable, it didn't work. Let's just take it off our list. That clearly is not something that thrives in Summit County. Now, granted, there's gonna be times when like, okay, it's super easy to grow lettuce up here. And someone might not have had a successful lettuce, lettuce season, and it's not because lettuce doesn't grow well up here. It's because maybe their soil wasn't good or they didn't water it for two weeks or you know something else happened. Um, so, Anyway, I just wanted to give you the history of how we've been working on this, and we will continue to update this. So it's also a good call to all of you at the end of your season to give us that feedback. Jen will provide you with the form, because um, it really helps everybody then to grow more successfully. On this first page, you'll see it's, it's all the different vegetables and greens. And where it says degree of difficulty, it all says easy. So hopefully you like some of these vegetables that are on here and you will agree at the end of the season that it was easy to grow those things. You'll notice that we have great success up here with all the leafy greens. If you like lettuces and spinach and arugula and kale and chard, you're in sight. You're going to have a great summer. Um, I have had wonderful luck with sugar snap peas and snow peas. Um, those are one, and I don't think it says on here, you're going to want to have something for them to trellis on. And there were a lot of creative things going on last year, and I know Jen was trying to set some limits on what's allowed and what's not. But just be aware that if you're going to plant most kinds of snap peas, they need some kind of trellis. Um, you can get, you know, like the, the round metal, almost like tomato planter kinds of things, or you could put in some... Um, I use chicken wire at home, but make sure you check in with Jen's rules about what's allowed and what's not for that. Uh, okay, so look where it says onion. It says transplant bulbs or onion sets. Again, you're going to want to go to one of the garden centers and buy these onion sets, um, and it'll have the instructions for how to plant them. It's very easy, but if you like onions, they do really great up here. Potatoes you're gonna to wanna to use what are called seed potatoes. It's really important that you don't go to the store and buy potatoes and try to cut them up and plant those. You'll, you'll hear about that and read about that, but there's a lot of like fungus that can be in store-bought potatoes, and you, you do wanna buy 
seed potatoes from, again, one of the garden centers to plant. Potatoes are an interesting one because they grow great up here, but you may want to decide how much you love potatoes and how much of your plot you want to use for them because they'll take up a lot of room. They Potatoes that grow really interesting. Like I would almost say if you want to grow potatoes, just get some kind of pot or something at home and grow them there. Like don't waste your plot space on potatoes because they grow so well. And again, when you buy your seed potatoes, it'll have the directions. But when you initially plant the potatoes, you don't plant them very deep. And the vines start growing up and then you keep mounding more dirt on them and the vines just keep growing and growing and the, they mound, mound, mound. And then near the end of the season, those vines will start to turn yellow and that's when you know your potatoes are ready. And if you have them in a pot, you can just turn the pot over and pick out all these potatoes. And so it's like one big fun harvest. You can harvest them more incrementally through the season, but that's how a lot of people do it. So I personally feel like Potatoes may be not the best choice to put in your plot, but I would grow them. Um, so think about how you want to do it. Um, shallots, you can get the little bulbs, just like the onion sets. I know we're going to be carrying those this year. Um, so if you turn to the second page, the <laughs> lower half of the second page is all about herbs and edible flowers. You'll notice, as she just brought up, that a lot of these herbs recommend, they say direct seed or transplant. Some herbs have a pretty long growing season. Um, so that's something you're gonna, you know, I've had, well, like cilantro to me grows like a weed up here from seed. So that's one that I would just do from seed. Um, but like, you know, to me like oregano and some of these other ones, I would buy a transplant. Okay. Yeah. So, and I know that at Summit Landscaping and at some of the other garden centers, we buy organic herb transplants, and they're not that expensive. They're, I think they're very good value for you buy the little transplant, and by the end of the summer, you have this huge herb. And the great thing about herbs is then you can bring them inside. You can just, you know, if you have them in your garden here, when it starts to get cold, put them in a pot, put them on your windowsill at home, and you can keep eating off of them. I'm still using my oregano, my tarragon, and my sage from last summer. Some of the other ones have died off over the winter, but those are still going strong. So in chives, oh man, those do, yeah. those go crazy. Now when you say like seven or eight in your whole pot, is that inclusive of herbs as well, or herbs? Like a you know, area? yeah, I would, you could do like one section of your, your garden be all herbs would probably be, yeah, so I wouldn't limit yourself that much, yeah. Uh, oh, which the question that she just asked actually made me think of something else I wanted to talk about a little bit. A lot of us have this sort of old-fashioned notion that when you're planting in a plot, everything should be in lines. And we, the reason a lot of us think that way is because we think of farmers that have these huge, you know, multi, you know, thousands of acres fields, and they're worried about having room for people to walk and machinery to go through. When you're planting in a small plot, try to get rid of that whole notion of planting in rows. Some people are orderly and really need that mm -hmm. symmetry, and that's fine. But that's not actually the best way to utilize the limited space that you have in your plot. There's some information, and I bet if you just started doing some Google searches about like square foot gardening, that talk about the ways to best utilize a small plot, like what you guys are going to have. For example, if you're going to grow lettuce, I would take an area, you know, yay big, what is that, 24 by 24, and almost just take your lettuce seeds and just sprinkle them everywhere, because that whole area can probably support lettuce, and then you've just got this one big part of your plot that's all salad, um, and you can just go, you know, cut that, and the lettuce, if it, when the lettuce grows, if you, all, if you keep about a third of the length left in the ground at all times, it'll keep growing, so you'll get multiple harvests. Awesome. You don't want to pull your lettuce out ever. You're cutting, but leave enough, leave like a third of the growth so that it'll just keep growing. What kind is be grows best? I've, almost any of the lettuces are going to do great, with the exception of iceberg. Um, but romaine, all the leaf lettuces, mescaline, they all do great. Yeah. 
So, but think about that with the about the space and how you're going to utilize your space because you could waste a lot of space if you just have all these rows of chard and beets. You know, you just want to plan well so that everything's <coughs> properly spaced. And we're going to talk about proper spacing in a moment here, but utilizing all your space. When you harvest the lettuce, do you have to cut it with scissors or can you take it? I cut it with scissors. Okay. To me, that's the easiest. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I've got all these things I want to talk about. I'm trying to decide the best, best order. Okay. I've got a few seed packets, and the part of why I'm going to pass these out is if, you know, just pass them around, and I mostly want people to be looking at some of the information. So just grab one and pass them around. One of the first things you'll notice. Yep. Can I interrupt you? Um, yeah. Go back to list really quick. I want to know if you have any success with tomatoes. Okay. Let's. I'll go right to your question while we're distributing the seeds because that's a great question. If you look at the top of the second page, it says warm season vegetables, and the ones we've got listed are basil, tomatillo, tomatoes, and zucchini. And then if you, if you just continue across the top of that page where it says must be kept above 50 degrees, the bummer about tomatoes and all of these things, and th this holds true as well for peppers, a lot of the fun stuff we wish we could grow. If you're not keeping them above 50 degrees, they do not do well. And in fact, tomatoes just basically die. Um, 50 degrees is not very realistic for Summit County. Um, we do have, maybe we're lucky when we have a big string of nights where it stays above 50, but it's not a long growing season. So I personally, if you wanna to try to grow a tomato, there are some methods that you can use. One, if you have a greenhouse, of course, try it inside your house. I grew a tomato just in a pot on my windowsill last year and I had a pretty big pot and it did great, but it was inside my house. At all times. Yeah. Well, you could put it out during the day if you okay. want to be really involved with your plants and don't mind putting it out in the day and bringing it in at night, but you just don't want it to be getting below 50. So my patio only gets afternoon sun. Okay. Would that be enough? Mm-mm. Mm -hmm. You're going to want tomatoes like a lot of sun. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I always tell people is if you want to try something, try it. I, I'm wrong all the time. Maybe I'm wrong about this, you know. Um, and one nice thing is a lot of times, a lot of these things aren't a huge investment. You can buy a little tomato starter for $2 and be like, hey, I'm going to check and see if this works this year, you know. It's not a huge investment. But... I think most people that don't have a greenhouse living in Summit County consider trying to grow tomatoes maybe kind of a hobby, like you'll get two or three tomatoes, but not an uh, actual productive crop. So. How often do you water? A lot, of course, is going to depend on the weather. A really typical weather pattern in Summit County is we tend to have a very dry, hot June. And then the monsoonal flow comes in in July and August, and we tend to get almost daily rain. So once that starts happening, hopefully you'll never have to water. Um, but in June, when things are starting, it doesn't necessarily have to be daily, especially if you use some kind of mulch to hold in moisture. And what I mean by that is a lot of people will use like a weed-free straw, and after they've planted all their seeds, they'll put the straw all over their bed, and that helps hold in moisture. And then you can get away with less frequent watering. Um, a lot of these things really like water, and I'll admit it. You can get away with only watering every three days, but your garden may thrive more if it gets more water than that. So it's pretty frequent. Starting date. Okay, oh, that's a great question. Technically, in Summit County, our average last frost, which I actually don't believe there is such a thing because I've seen it <laughs> snow on for the July, um, is they say around Father's Day. So it's in the you know mid to late June time frame. Now, that's not to say you couldn't start planting a little sooner. I, these plots here at Breckenridge are in an amazing location. They get all day full sun and they stay pretty warm. So I would say, you know, in that 
first to second week of June is probably a good time. And obviously watch the weather forecast and see if we're going to have some big low temperatures. Um, really, the once you get your seeds in, you want the, the soil temperature to have already warmed up enough. And that's about the time when that's generally happening. And then as the seeds are germinating, you just don't want them to have a big frost or that's when they're going to be really delicate and they're not hardened off to the cold temperatures yet. Um, and so that's when you're going to need a little more, you know, just warm. That was my next question about frost <clears throat> and use of plastic. Yep. Now, you know, this might be a good question for you. Did you use your plastic covering? What did you feel about it? Um, I thought it helped, but there became a point in the summer where I just didn't, it wasn't worth it to go there every night and cover it and every morning and uncover it, you know, like by the time we got to July, it was like just leave it uncovered and then you catch all the rain and you get more water and it, and it's in it all the sun, but I thought the plastic was really helpful in the beginning with the seeds. Great. And that is, I think, what most people would probably is. say. Those are season extenders, and at the beginning, in June, when you're planting, if you, especially that's hopefully when you'll still be all excited and you're happy to go <laughs> twice a day to your garden, um, <laughs> you know, or collaborate with other people and be like, hey, I'll get your garden in the morning if you'll get mine tonight. Um, but use those because they will help, you know, keep your garden warmer. That the sun really is just the heat is amplified through that plastic, um, and it'll just it'll help hold in heat. That's not to say if we have a really cold frost, your garden's still going to get cold. It's not it's not a greenhouse that's being heated, but it really helps. It really does help hold in heat for a longer period of time. So, but I think what you're saying is. It's more in June mm -hmm. that that's when it's really helpful. And then maybe again at the end of the season, when we get into September and October and we start getting some cold nights. A lot of, my best harvest is in September. That's when everything's going crazy and I am just, can't even keep up. I'm bringing, I'm dropping off bags of lettuce at people's doors and bringing the doorbell and running, you know. Um, so, because <laughs> you can't eat it all. Um, so, you know, really the thing that stops most of us from gardening is when it's just, it's snowy and it's like, okay, I gotta call it quits. But your season can actually go pretty late into the fall. So, but I think you're right, in July and August, especially if we're getting these daily rains, you want that moisture hitting your garden. You don't want the plastic keeping the moisture away. So, so for those of you that have a seed packet near you, You'll see this particular brand, which is a really great brand, Botanical Interest. Um, you know, we only carry non-GMO organic seeds, and that, I know that you guys are required to garden organically. I'm not sure if it extends to the seeds you plant, but to me it's a great idea. You don't pay that much more money to get a really high quality seed. But you'll see that on these, on, their, on the left hand side, they kind of have a list of the properties of the seed and it, they, these all say cool season. Living in Summit County where it is the temperatures we have, our summer is what we call the cool season. If you lived in Denver, the cool season is right now. You would be growing all of these crops in April and May and then in June in Denver your lettuce would die because it's too hot. And that's when you would start, you'd have your tomatoes and your zucchini and all those other, your peppers. And then you would again in the fall grow your cool season crops. Well here, we grow cool season crops right through the summer. So any of the seed packets that do specify cool season or warm season, that's just a great indicator for you. If it says cool season, it's probably on this list that Jen and I put together. Uh, and that's what you want to be watching for. If you see something that says warm season, yeah, unless you've got a greenhouse or you're planning to grow it inside or have your wall of water that may or may not be very effective. Um, okay, and then the other great thing about these is if you flip it over, it's got all the information about how to plant. And then the other cool thing, and I actually don't want you to open these up, but the botanical interest seeds, when you open up this package, it has even more thorough information printed on the inside of the package. They do a really good job. But when you look at the back of these packets, you'll see information about seed depth, 
and seed spacing. Seed, both of those are important to try to follow. Seed depth, I think the, one of the biggest ways that people have a failure in their garden is by actually planting things too deep. We tend to want to like stick your finger in and that, thing's, that seed is in there two inches deep and it's actually probably not going to germinate. But read what it says about your seed and any seed packages you buy should have this information. Um, but a lot of the lettuce seeds germinate best at like an eighth of an inch below the soil surface, which really means like when I plant my lettuce, I sprinkle out all the lettuce seeds and then I just lightly rake it in and then water it get it packed down in there. Um, but you don't want these things buried very deep. So you need to avoid that temptation to stick your finger in two inches deep and get your seed way in there. Um, they're actually gonna do best near the surface. Um, but again, it just it depends on the vegetable. So just make sure you follow those instructions. Seed spacing is how far apart those things should be from each other. And the main thing that happens if you start planting things too <coughs> close together is they start crowding each other out and they actually don't grow as well. A hard thing to plant, although it's a very successful crop up here, are carrots. And one thing that I have learned with planting carrots is the seeds are tiny and it's so hard to make sure they're getting spaced properly. So don't worry about it too much. Do your best to space them out knowing that when those carrots start growing, you're gonna start seeing all their little greens, you need to thin them. And it's hard, you just made something grow. It's alive, you don't wanna pull it up, but you need to. And you need to thin out those carrots so that they are like two inches apart from each other or whatever the package says. So with any of your crops, as they start to grow, if you realize like, oh wow, look at all those beets, right next to each other. Don't get excited that you've got tons of beets because they're actually not going to grow very big. You're going to have a better beet to harvest if you space them out. So, what else? Um, back to your question about watering. My personal preference is always to water in the morning. I think that's the best time. I know that's not always going to fit into everyone's schedule, and that's okay. But I do think it's nice to start the day with your garden wet, and so when it gets hot and sunny, it's, it's healthy and it's not getting all dried out. How much is too much? That is a great question. Um, how much is too much? It takes a lot to overwater. You know, when we'll get these huge monsoonal flows and, you know, it rains every day heavily in all of July and August, my garden does great. It loves it. Um, obviously, you could, especially when you've just got little seeds, you could overwater because then you could make the seeds all kind of float away. Um, so then you're just more into trying to get your soil moist and keep it damp, but not, yeah. Did it. you have any problem with critters or animals? Oh, thank you for bringing up yeah. critters. Oh, Late season vole control. Goodness. We had yeah, okay. Last year. The voles were out of control last year. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And if you don't know, voles are Vol? field mice. So they're like little mice. And of all my years of gardening, I had never saw anything like last year. I have a theory, and I'm totally making this up so that I could be really wrong, but I think because last year we had such a mild winter, do you know, and I'm not talking, I'm not talking about this winter, 2012, 2013, I'm talking about the previous winter, 2011, 2012, it never got below negative 10. Voles are constantly breeding. There, there was one of those little pests that are constantly having new litters. I think that one of the controls that tends to happen over the winter is we get these cold snaps down to minus 20, minus 30, and it kills off a lot of their litters, and that never happened. And I think they just were able to really thrive because of that. Again, I'm making this up. I could be totally wrong. <laughs> You're not. That's true. But is it? It's okay. When I talked to my a pest guy because oh. I was so upset about the voles last year. Yeah. And it is. It's a, it's a light season, a very mild season that... Um, increases their numbers and the only thing which um, like natural um, control would be a very cold summer with no snow because the snow is an insulator and they live in it so I was keeping my fingers crossed at the beginning of the year but I think, yeah I think 
but we, we need we need to stay. But you too. think that this last winter was cold enough? Yeah, I'm hoping. We, this past <laughs> winter we had temperatures down to minus twenty five. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that helped. Um, we're we're gonna see. Yeah. They could still be pretty bad. So what to do about them? Were they bad in the plots here? They did get bad at the Brent. Brett Garden. By okay. The end of the summer, they were they were yeah, everywhere. It's late, it's late season. Yeah. yeah Did you there. have any strategies or hear other people about what they were doing? No, because it's organic gardening. There really wasn't much we could do unless you wanted to start trapping them. But <laughs> yep. that's not what I want to see when I come to the ground garden. Right. Yeah. Is trapped voles. So I just kept trying to flood them out, scare them away. How do you spell voles? They're V O L E. V -O -L -E. And they're they're field mice. It's like a mouse oh, with a pointed snout. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. like and if you see it start happening, my suggestion is just pull everything. Start okay. harvesting everything. Yeah. Because they just slowly go through and they get all the things with big roots. So yeah, they love was, the carrots and, like, and the beans. You know, the Swiss chard and like kale and everything that carrots. have a big root on it. And it's, eventually you just see the row kind of just dwindling. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. harvest. so just harvest. And um, little paths through you, they're like living there. Yeah, yes. yeah. So the point is that you are gardening organically at these plots, so you are not allowed to use any pesticides or pest controls of that nature. Um, we're going to be selling a whole bunch of products that are natural. We and I'm not, I don't know yet how well they're going to work, but like we've got these little. Have you guys seen before when you have mice in your house and you can plug this little thing and it sends out some frequency? Oh, thing. We've got those for gardens that are like little solar powered and battery powered things. Hopefully they'll work. We'll see. Um, the mouse traps and uh, obviously is uh, people are going to have different opinions about that. Um, but, you know, killing them naturally, so to speak. <laughs> um, the, the cat that lives over at Summit Landscaping takes care of our vault problem. I mean, it's amazing. What about uh, insects? Yeah. Insects. Insects. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, those kind of pets. So let me let me get to that in one moment. Let me keep talking about the voles real quick. Um, there are some homemade remedies that involve castor oil and peppermint oil and garlic oil that you could try. That voles don't like castor oil. So again, talk to Jen about her comfort level with using anything like that. But those are some pretty natural ways that you can hopefully try to keep the voles away. Um, hopefully in the location here at Breck, deer won't be a problem, but that's another one that like if you've got a garden at home, the deer like to come through. Um, you know what's one of the best things, and I hope this doesn't gross people out, human urine. They hate that smell, and you're not gonna pour it on your garden. You're pouring it on the wood, the wood that's forming the raised bed, but just put it on your neighbor's garden? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but in all honesty, that, that human scent, they hate it. And so the more human scent you can get around your garden, the better. And I, I'm not saying to put urine on your vegetables. Mm -hmm. Pour it around. And it's really easy to do at home. I mean, I just tell my husband to go out there. And, <laughs> and, uh, he, he knows in the summer. That's what he's, that's I think you get what he's instructed to do. <laughs> yep. um, but a human hair is a really good oh. way to deter deer. Um, you know, I've heard of people taking like old nylon stockings and filling them with hair. And and then just you know staple them to the side of your sure. gardens and you know deer just don't like that's a territorial <coughs> kind of thing that's how a lot of animals function that's they so smell <coughs> what's that back in indiana we do environmental restoration we plant hundreds of trees and shrubs and whatever but deer would go to town but certain contracts we were uh contracted to put uh, part of the plan was to do dial soap Joel really so put it on a tea post or whatever okay so. Interesting. I've never heard that. Um, so anyway, hope that again, hopefully at these gardens, I don't were we didn't deer, have any yeah, deer I problems last year, but I think people are afraid that they just haven't found us yet. Okay, so that we'll could see. change. And so hopefully the fence will help if that changes. Yeah, is that going to happen this season? Hopefully, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, the fence helps a lot. Okay, so then the next question was about bugs and those kind of pests. Aphids. Aphids love like kale. Um, they love a lot of those. They, I've never had problems with lettuce, but they love kale. That's a big one. 
So again, there are some really good natural homemade things that you can do for aphids. I don't have the recipe on hand, but if you just Google homemade aphid killer or whatever, it's basically you're just in your blender, you're putting garlic, cayenne pepper, you know, some other things like that, and then you're just blending it with some water, putting in a spray bottle and spraying all over everything. Um, and that works a lot. Another great thing to do with aphids is if these garden hoses, if you've got a jet, just knocking them off of things kills them and makes them kind of lose their gumption. So that's a really good way to do it. And then you can also use like Dr. Bronner's soap and make a, a liquid soap product to put on things. So there's a lot of different techniques for aphids that are really natural. Um, we also do sell some organic products that have neem oil, and I would want you guys to check with Jen about if she's okay with using those or not. They're considered organic, but I just I don't know exactly the parameters that she has set for some of those things. Um, aphids tend to be the biggest problem that I've encountered. Um, did you have pest problems? You good? Just bulls. Okay. <laughs> so, but again, I would just you know, check in with Jen about what products are okay, and there's a lot of homemade things that you can use for pests that do a pretty good job. So. What about, how, what kind of success have you had with second plantings? Okay, like, great we, question. We, one year we've had it, we did great, and other years it was a disaster. Really? Okay, so what he's talking about with the second planting is, let's say on June 15th this year, you go out and plant your whole garden, and come July 30th, Everything's just been doing so great, but you've got this little bare spot. Can you plant more? The things that, anything with a really short growing season, if you guys have a seed packet in front of you, it'll say, like it says, cool season, 62 days. 62 days is the length of the growing season. There are things like radishes. Some of the radishes have like a 30 to 40 day growing season. So you absolutely, on August 1st, could plant a whole batch of radishes and be eating them in September. So those, you just want to look for something with a really short growing season. And by short, I'm talking probably in the like 30 to 40 or maybe to 50 day growing season. And then it's fine to, you've harvested one thing, plant something else. With like lettuce, do you plant every three weeks? Do you just add more seeds in your garden? Or? Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's called succession planting. And that's another thing people do all the time is just... Plant some on June 15th and plant another batch on June 30th and another batch on July 15th. And that way you just always have fresh things growing. I mean, I think a lot of the greens taste best when they're little anyway. And so just to be constantly having new fresh greens is kind of nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.